Dear From Software, Hi, it's me, Austin. I bet you thought I'd never write to you, didn't you? I mean, Dark Souls 3 came out in April of 2016, or frickin' March if you lived in Japan. What the actual hell is up with that? There's literally no excuse for production delays like that in this digital age where I can download literally every game ever made for every system in the world in mere moments, unless you're Nintendo's virtual console. Dark Souls 3 has been out for nearly a year now, and its second and final DLC is on the way, and for all this time since I first started making science videos, I've been racking my brain trying to figure out a way to make a video on it. I've looked at things big and small, trivial and not, from trying to apply macroeconomic theories to the weird soul-based economy of the world to calculating how much property damage the average Souls player causes throughout the course of normal gameplay by destroying hand-carved maple dining room tables and elaborate candlesticks sticks but nothing worked at least not until today <laughs> Today, finally, I can apply my massive, pulsating, engorged science brain to the world of Dark Souls. Finally, that nearly 200 hours I've clocked mindlessly farming Lothric Knights will pay off. And some of you may think you know where I'm going with this. Oh yeah, Austin, we've seen this before. You pick something objectively ludicrous, lazily debunk it using fancy physics formulas and large numbers in Newtons or Joules. We've seen this song and dance before. What, is it gonna be how absurd swinging those weapons are? Just gonna pick the biggest phallic object in the game, slap a makes no goddamn sense on it, and follow up with a goddamn terrifying 10 out of 10 YouTube episode. Would watch again. I, I get it. You're on to me. That's definitely my modus operandi, but Dark Souls is different from other games, and as such, it wouldn't feel right to analyze how absurd the Fume Ultra Greatsword is, or the terrifying implications of giant lizards that spew fire. No! For such an amazingly well thought out and artistically consistent franchise, we're gonna have to do something a little different. We're gonna look at my favorite boss of the entire franchise, the Dancer of the Boreal Valley. If you look up the Dancer of the Boreal Valley on YouTube, you'll be flooded with enraged Let's Players and streamers slamming their fists on their keyboards as they die over and over and over and over to this elegant, slithering master swordswoman. And unless you were this asshole who beat her without rolling, dodging, or parrying, you were probably the same way. I'm just kidding, Ptolemyr. You're awesome. I'm jealous. This boss is hard. There's no way around it. But after analyzing this beautiful monster, I finally unraveled the mystery of what makes this boss such a pain in the rear. And after watching this video, you too will hopefully understand the dancer a little better and become a dancer slaying nightmare. What makes the dancer of the Boreal Valley such a pain to fight? And how can we use science to figure her out? Well, we've worn many academic hats during the rich and varied history of my videos. Physics hats, thermodynamics hats, quantum mechanics hats, history hats, so many hats, so little time. But today, we're gonna be donning a whole new hat. One we've never used before, and one that amazingly completely explains everything you'd ever want to know about the Dancer of the Boreal Valley, and honestly, Dark Souls itself as a franchise. And that hat? That hat is the music theory hat. Music theory may seem like a weird field of study to apply to Dark Souls, and it may seem even stranger coming from my mouth, but bear with me, because by the end of this video, your mind is gonna be f***ing blown. We think of music as art, and it is, but for centuries, academics and scientists have been trying to piece together and rationalize the study of music. Not just to understand why it makes us feel the things we feel, but also because musicians want to, you know, make good music. And there's no better way to make good music than to figure out why other good music is, you know, Good. There's thousands of different micro fields of music theory from compositional analysis to timbre. Shout out to those of you who were hoping I'd say that incorrectly, but today we're gonna be looking at one specific field 
rhythm. You see, Dark Souls at its heart is a rhythm game, like Simon. The entire game is a conversation between you, the player, and the enemies in the game. You know, call and response. The enemy is like, hey bro, red, red, and you have to respond accordingly the right way or your face gets turned into mulch. It's like that Cab Calloway song, Minnie the Moocher, except instead of doing a call and response with music, it's with swords, shields, and the inevitable sadness of getting smashed into a bloody puddle because you timed your roll just wrong. Dark Souls is a game of downbeats and upbeats. The downbeat being when the enemy winds up and broadcasts their incoming attack and the eventual attack and hopefully your effective response coming on the offbeat or onbeat. It's all about learning your enemy's attack patterns, like someone practicing music in fifth grade band. Repetition makes perfect and eventually you learn the song that Dark Souls is playing. You get an ear for the light motifs in the combat and learn how to counter most enemies even if it's your first time encountering them. But then, there are tricky mother like the Dancer of the Boreal Valley. If Dark Souls is Minnie the Moocher, then the Dancer of the Boreal Valley is this part. <laughs> Forget everything you've learned in your entire time playing the game. The dancer is gonna rip it out of your skull after cracking your cranium like a nutcracker with her twin scimitars. Why is the dancer of the Boreal Valley so hard? And how is music theory and rhythm gonna help us understand this? First, let's look at another boss, the Abyss Watchers. If you take a typical attack of the Abyss Watchers, say this swing here, and start your mythical downbeat when the initial broadcast of the attack begins, when he draws his sword back, if you plot the points of attack you get four perfect points almost exactly evenly spaced from one another. And every attack when you plot out their pacing and rhythm falls on one of these lines. If you consider this chunk to be a measure and the attacks to be the melody, this means that the attack rhythm of the Abyss Watchers is what's known as 4-4 four, four notation. Per measure, there are four quarter notes. Boom, 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 boom. And since 4-4 four, four is one of the most common rhythmic notations in music, predicting the patterns of attacks in 4-4 four, four is relatively easy once you get a hang of the tempo and the different melodies the Abyss Watcher throws at you. There's a few eighth notes thrown in there for variety, he is a Lord of Cinder after all, but all in all, this is a pretty standard dance once you get used to it. And honestly, almost every single boss and enemy in the game attacks in 4-4, even the incredibly challenging Nameless King. The challenge with these more difficult and powerful bosses isn't the rhythm itself, but both the tempo and the lack of rests. There's a lot more eighth notes in the Nameless King fight than there are in the Abyss watchers and you don't get a ton of time to collect your thoughts but still all in all boom boom this is the rhythm almost every enemy in the game attacks you with and this here is the key behind what makes the dancer of the boreal valley so mind crushingly demoralizing In order to understand the dancer, first we have to understand her music, the music that plays underneath the entire boss fight, because this song, the dancer's song, is in many ways reflective of the dancer herself. And it's the first major hint we get that this fight isn't gonna be a walk in the park. Most boss music in the game has a fairly easily discernible melody and rhythm. This isn't the case with the dancer of the Boreal Valley, at least not immediately. You get one quiet drum beat followed by a droning chorus and strings. And this repeats several times as you first get acquainted with the boss. It's not until later that there's even a semblance of rhythm, and even then it's hard to locate. Here, let me, let me just give you a second to see if you can find it. Did you hear it? Could you find the beat. It's okay if you didn't, it took me listening to eight seconds of this song over and over again for three hours and splicing its spectral frequency apart chunk by chunk to figure out the rhythm of this piece of crap. It's so difficult to figure out because, counterintuitively, drums aren't what's keeping the rhythm, it's the strings. And if you pick apart the most complex melody and overlay it on top of the droning strings and voices, you get an undeniably clear picture of what the rhythm of the song is. It's 3-4, which in layman's terms means there's three quarter notes per measure. Demonstrably different than almost every other song in the game. Why is this significant? Because the dancer? The dancer follows the exact same rhythm. Remember before when I mentioned that most of the enemies follow the 4-4 four, four rhythmic pattern? Well, the dancer bucks tradition because of course she does and follows 3-4 just like her song. How do I know this? 
because of her footsteps. The dancer of the Boreal Valley keeps meticulous time throughout the entire boss fight through her carefully timed footsteps, the beat ringing out through the halls and in your ears, warning you that this serpentine monster is coming to ruin your day. If you look at the timing, they're perfectly spaced apart, and this? This is the key to understanding what makes her ever so difficult. Because it's not just about having a different rhythm than most other boss fights and enemies. Oh no, that's not enough. The basic pattern most of Dark Souls follows is the downbeat becomes the broadcast of the attack, and the attack itself typically arrives on the upbeat, the last beat of the measure. Occasionally you get snippets here and there that break the mold, but they're the exception, not the norm. But for the dancer? The abnormal is the normal. Because you see, not only are her attacks in 3-4 time measure, but when the downbeat comes, the signal that an attack is coming, every single one of her attacks comes at unpredictable moments. Not a single attack from the dancer comes on the upbeat. And quite frequently, from the moment she broadcasts her attack, she waits several measures before the attack finally comes. And then, it's on an offbeat. A beat that's in the middle of a measure. Like, take this move for instance. She broadcasts her attack here, which is our downbeat of one. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. She waits two whole measures and attacks one beat in. And like every single attack of hers is like that. They all follow the three, four pattern and they all arrive on off beats. The only attack that doesn't, it's this one. This whirlwind of death. And it doesn't matter because if you get caught in the way of this thing, you get totally creamed. And the closer you look, the more astounding and concrete the connections between the song and the dancer become. The song has three major sections. The slow introduction, the more vibrant middle bit, and the last third. All of which have their own tempos. While this may seem insignificant at first, if you look at the attack patterns of the dancer, she also has three phases. You're familiar with the two. There's the first, where she slowly yet menacingly waltz is around the room swinging at you cautiously. Then, when she's threatened, she pulls another sword from the ground and begins a more vivacious attack. However, there's actually a third phase that isn't indicated by any signals, but when you get her below one-sixth health, she begins attacking more frequently, moving from 36 attacks per minute to 47 on average. Similarly, the tempo of her song for the last third is also slightly faster than the rest, coming in at 145 beats per minute as opposed to 100. Interesting to note that her phases, her attack phases, those are also in 3-4 time signature. There's two measures separated by her drawing her sword from the ground, and the final third of the last section, or third quarter note, is a more vivacious attack pattern. Thirds, threes, and repetition everywhere. This fight and the song behind it are, at their core, a huge analogy for the Dark Souls series itself. The song repeats the same motif over and over and over again, just like the linking of the fire cycle has repeated over and over and over again. Like the linking of the fire cycle, the song increases in complexity and chaos as it moves forward, just like the dancer does. In fact, as the song progresses, more and more instruments join the fray as the tempo accelerates. It reminds me a hell of a lot of another song, one that also repeats the same leitmotifs over and over again, gaining complexity and anxiety over time. One that that, incidentally, is also in 3-4 time, Ravel's Bolero. Bolero, written by Maurice Ravel. One of the last pieces he ever wrote, in fact, repeats the same melody over and over and over again for 15 minutes, adding instruments, volume, and layers as it progresses. It's one of my favorite pieces of all time, and I can think of no better analog for the Soul series than this piece of music. And you may not be able to tell just by listening, but Bolero is just as much about decay and death as it is about pretty Russian dancers. It was, of course, commissioned by a wealthy Russian dancer not unlike the dancer of the Boreal Valley herself, who was the daughter of royalty. It was, sadly, one of the last pieces Ravel composed before he died. Why did he die? 
Frontal temporal dementia. Patients with frontal temporal dementia experience a decay of what's called spindle neurons in the front part of their brain. Boiling down neurons to a simple role is kind of impossible because our brains are amazing! But basically, these things are responsible for sending messages back and forth between major sections of the brain. What happens over time is that the frontal and temporal lobes end up looking like Swiss cheese as these neurons unravel. Get it? Anyway, people with this disease during the early stages tend to become fixated on repeating patterns over and over and over again until eventually their brain starts to lose its ability to function correctly. The dancer of the Boreal Valley was slowly transformed into a horrific monster by the Pontiff Sullivan and is trapped in a cycle of fighting you over and over and over and over again, using every rhythmic trick her dancer brain can conspire to send you away. And yet you continue to come at her again and again until, like Maurice Ravel, she finally cannot fight any longer. So, if you're having any trouble with the dance or the Boreal Valley, don't worry, you're not alone! Find some 3-4 time signature rhythm exercises to do online and try not to think about the dancer's tragic story of loss and her own physical and mental degeneration. After all, the moral of Dark Souls is that all things, repetitive or not, eventually come to an end. The dancer, the linking of the fire, and even you, the player. None of us are immune to the cold, clawing grasp of the unfeeling cosmic forces. If you don't die from an aneurysm from stress from playing Dark Souls, and if you don't die from frontal temporal dementia, you're still not immortal. You, your friends, everything you love is impermanent, so cherish what you have and make your life a good one. Holy sh! I've been playing too much Dark Souls. I think I'm gonna need to up my Zolov dosage again. Sincerely, Austin. Thank you, everyone, for watching my video on Dark Souls. Kind of a weird topic to choose to do with the with the time signatures and stuff, but time and rhythm, it's all very mathy, and I like math. So it's like the kind of music, the part of music that I actually understand. Is there anything else you'd like to know about Dark Souls or any other game that you can think of? Be sure to follow me at AR Horrigan on Twitter if you want to know cool stuff about me, and then, you know, subscribe to the channel yet if you haven't, because you should do it because that's what I I'm a youtuber and I'm supposed to tell people to subscribe to the channel um, there's game theory there's my stuff here too and <coughs> I'm getting over a cold so I'm gonna I'm gonna go goodbye <laughs>